I shared last week about the Israelites journeying to the other side of the Jordan River. And they had a simple command to fulfill on the journey to the other side. It was this, Exodus chapter 23. It says, I will establish your borders from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines. Where is this whole territory I will give to you. And from the desert to the Euphrates. For I will deliver the inhabitants into your hand and you will drive them out before you. Can we say drive them out? Can you see how God is always wanting us to partner with him in this journey of occupying the space that he's called us to? He's always wanting us to partner with him in putting our nets on the other side and seeing the biggest catch come in. The the moment of the miraculous, the moment of the supernatural, God wants to partner with humanity. That's been his plan all along. Since he created the earth, he put man in place and says, I want you to have dominion as you're connected to me. I want you to rule and reign over this earth. I want you to be those that carry my my God-likeness into the world around us and so we we see right here that the the promise is i will deliver you from this land means i will give you the victory i will make sure that you have won i will make sure that you have all that you need for life and godliness i will make sure that you have the full package deal i will withhold nothing from you i will i will not uh, give you half measures i will give you the fullness of my deliverance but i ask you to drive them out the areas of darkness that you see, drive them out from this place of victory. You shall not make a covenant with them or with their gods. They must not remain in your land, lest they cause you to sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. This morning I want us, the title is, on the other side, time to enforce our victory. I want us to understand something. Now I'm going to do this over two parts. Uh, This part is going to sound incredibly like a warning. The next part is going to sound like incredibly like a jubilation victory moment. Uh, And you'll see in 1 Samuel 13 and 14, the text that I'm going to use today, that that's the reality, is that we are in a warfare. I don't like talking about the devil. I don't like people talking about the devil because I don't think he needs attention. We need to talk about God. We need to talk about the goodness of God, the triumph of God. We need to talk about the fruitfulness of God. We need to talk about the nature of God. But there are times that we need to be aware that there are Areas in our lives that the enemy wants to rob, kill, and destroy. He wants to convince us that we are no longer seated in heavenly places in Christ. He wants to to try and minimize, just like he did to Jesus, the fact that we are sons and daughters of God. He wants to destroy our confidence that we have in this finished work that Jesus has accomplished. And so we see in all of this that, and I'm going to go into 1 Samuel chapter 13. You can turn there and just pause for a moment. That there are times that God calls and summons a people to a place of action and enforcing something that causes not just ourselves to come into a new place, but those around us. And I feel we are summoned into that place right now as a church community. God's looking for us to take hold on the other side of this glorious promise and inheritance that Jesus has won for us. But it means we have to understand firstly what we positioned in. We positioned in the victory of Christ. We positioned in the God who overcame all disease and sickness. We positioned in the finished work that said, it is no longer going to, darkness can no longer overtake you because I have overtaken darkness. Death has been swallowed up by victory. That's the position that Christ won for us. And friends, my, my heart is, is I want to see the reality of that here on earth because I see in scripture that everywhere where Jesus went, every sickness fleed. Everywhere where Jesus went, every word that he spoke was intentional around destroying a thought pattern that was stooped in darkness and was stooped in lies. And he brought truth into that place to set people free. The Bible says it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. The goal here is that we become freer and freer and freer and freer because we've already been fully set free in Christ. But God wants us to enforce that freedom, enforce that victory, and go after just like he gave on the other side the commandments to God's people. I will deliver you, but I want you to drive out all the inhabitants of that land that do not represent me. Friends, there's a partnership that God's calling us into. And I think sometimes we have not understood that or we have not taken personal responsibility for that. What do I mean by that? It's not our responsibility to defeat darkness. It's his. But it's our responsibility to position ourselves in glorious lights. And do whatever God says to see that darkness disappear. I'm not prescribing patterns. I'm not describing programs here. I'm describing a reality that Christ has done it all. He declared it's finished. Now, from that position, God sent us on mission to go and destroy the works of the evil one. 
which means my personal assignment every day I wake up is not to just focus on all the areas I feel insecure in. It's not to focus on all the areas that are barriers, areas of anxiety, areas of fear. It's not to focus on the me. It's to say, Father, there's an assignment upon our life by the Spirit of God to walk into spaces and to do what? Where there is poor understanding of the goodness of God, I speak good news. Where there are broken hearts, I carry the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord upon me to do something, to drive out those broken hearts with the kindness and mercy and love of God. Where there's blindness and nobody can see the truth, I come into those spaces and I drive out confusion and complacency and all those kind of things. I'm the one that declares liberty and freedom in an environment that's oppressed and difficult. Friends, that's the mission of God. And somehow, I think the church has forgotten that we're positioned in a glorious, liberating position in Christ, which means the mission becomes incredibly easy when we know where we're starting. You see, I said this last week, that Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross was not a white flag to the devil. What do I mean by that? So glad you asked me. It didn't mean that we now have peace between darkness and light. It didn't mean now that we had this, this resolution that we could coexist together somehow. It didn't mean a white flag of truce and peace. You know, like they say, listen, we are going to now agree to disagree. We are going to all coexist together, but we're going to do it in peace and harmony. Friends, that's not the goal. And I fear the church sometimes think that that's the goal. The goal is not peace, friends, because that's a false peace. The goal is freedom. Because freedom will always lead to peace. True freedom. And God's called us into the place right now where we understand that what, what, what was on Jesus' life, as he was in this world, so are you, friends. What was on his life? He said, I came to this earth to do one thing, to destroy the works of the evil one. And you can put the scripture up. Just so you can see this is legitimate. I'm not making this stuff up. 1 John 3 verse 8, this is why the Son of God was revealed, to destroy the works of the devil. Which means every area there was evidence that there was an inhabitant in our land, I'm talking about the land of our internal world and our external world. Every time I saw evidence of something that wasn't part of my Christ-like DNA and nature in God, I was commanded to drive that thing out. I was given the authority to drive that thing out. I was given the mandate to go and seek out those areas that were lost and bring them to a place where they found. I was mandated to go after sickness and see it come into the glorious liberating freedom of the blood of Jesus that says, by his stripes, I am healed. Not according to my experience, but according to the revelation of Christ. Because it can be so easy to look at my experience and say, well, it doesn't work. Friends, that's not what God's called us to. He's called us in this place to understand that Jesus is the pattern. Jesus is perfect experience of heaven on earth. You want to know what your role as a believer is, what it looks like? Study the life of Jesus and start to say, Father, as I'm positioned in Christ, I get to live in the same reality as you do. I get to be positioned with the same glorious authority to go and drive these things out. And this is, my, this is the crux of what I'm saying. Ephesians 5 verse 11. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Was the call to the Ephesian church. Why am I saying all this? I think sometimes we put up with too much darkness. Sometimes we put up with too much lies. Sometimes we put up with too many things that are just not God. Why? Because somehow we've lost our fight. Somehow, we've lost the position of authority we carry, of confidence to say that if Christ has done it, that's enough for me. If he has declared it, that's enough for me. If he said, every sickness will bow to the name of Jesus, that's enough for me. So when I go out to the hospitals, which I have committed to do ongoingly, until I see God do what he says he's going to do, I don't stop going. I don't stop pulling back. I don't pull back from this assignment. Why? Because I understand Jesus has done it all. And my role is not to coexist or cohabit with all the areas of darkness and hopelessness and discouragement and poverty around me. My goal is to bring it into glorious freedom and liberty. Is that your goal? Ask the person next to you, what's your goal?
Last week, God spoke to me quite profoundly. And I've been having these strong words from God because I feel like God's warning us. He's a kind father. He's a good shepherd. Part of the role of a shepherd is to, is to God. And I feel like there are some things in our lives that we have become comfortable to cohabit with that God's saying, I want you to drive out. Because the call to the guys who went on to the other side was do not covenant, do not make an agreement with these things, these areas of darkness in your life. Do not covenant with them. Drive them out. Okay, that's old covenants. Ephesians, he said the same thing. Do not have anything to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Drive them out. Get rid of them. That I think sometimes as the church, we like to cohabit with sickness. We like to cohabit with self-pity. We like to cohabit with feelings of inadequacy. And I'm just not good enough. We like to cohabit with lack and poverty. We like to we like to jump into bed with those things. Excuse the metaphor. But God's called us in the glorious liberty and freedom to position ourselves in Christ and say, actually, those things have been destroyed. Light has overcome darkness. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Sickness has been completely, 100% healed at the cross. You see, if we don't have a resolute faith in the finished work of Jesus, what we'll end up doing is we'll minimize the goodness of God and the understanding of who God is to our own experience. It's the most dangerous place all across humanity. God has been warning people, don't make an idol out of me. What is an idol? An idol is anything we worship over and above God. Friends, every area we have to check with before we say yes to God is an idol. I'm not talking about husband or wife. Every single time God calls us to do something or challenges us with truth, if we have to go and check it out and, and, and reason it through, those things are idols. I don't know. But last time I checked, the Bible said, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all else will be added to you. Last time I checked, they devoted themselves to prayer and to worship and to the apostles' teaching and breaking of bread. They met together praising and worshiping and celebrating the goodness of God in homes and in streets. They started to sacrificially live and give and sow their lives. That was the base of the early church. God's called us to live the same sacrificial life. That's God. In this space, God's calling us where we become like those who move to the other side. We become so determined not to partner or covenants with the inhabitants of darkness. I'll tell you a story that, that shocked me. I was part of it when I went to Ireland last time. The pastor phoned us as the team and said, listen, there's a lady in our church that has literally been on her, deaths, on her deathbed uh, for so long. She, is, she has so many issues, and I could list them all. It was, it was physical things, it was emotional things, it was all sorts of things. We walked into this house, and we began to pray. And we knew that God wanted to liberate her. We knew that God wanted to set her free. We had words. We felt the stirring of the authority of God to literally command those things to go. And I remember in that room, there were four or five of us, and we began to pray. God began to move in that space. And right at the end of the thing, she looked at us and says, I don't know if I want this. And I can tell you why. Because in that country, if you are sick, you are treated like royalty. In other words, she had got given a house that rebuilt her house so that she could have a single level dwelling so that she could get her wheelchair up and down. They had given her full-time nursing. People were at her aid all the time. They cooked for her. They cleaned for her. They, they did all her, her nursing duties. They, they ran errands for her. Everyone was running around her, paid for by the states. And I could go on. They filled her cupboards. They closed her. They made sure that her house was decorated nicely. I mean, everything that she wanted. So to say I'm not partnering with the sickness anymore means she had to let go of all her comforts. She had to let go of all her securities. She had to let go of all the things that she had been given as a result of the sickness. And she says, I can't do that. Friends, I think sometimes in our lives we're in the same place. Because God calls us to an evidence of the kingdom at work in our lives. He calls us to a place where he says, I want to do a profound miracle in your life. But we are so attached to so many things of this world that we say no to that because we are so, our security and our comforts are going to be tested. 
The financial system is shaking in the world around us. I can tell you the believers are crying like they've never cried before. I'm going, why? Our faith and our trust was never in that system. Well, maybe it was. Oh, but there's so many sickness. Cancer is just taking over the world. Well, where are the believers rising up in the authority of Christ to say, get behind me, Satan. It's time. Friends, I'm, I'm not trying to be, I'm trying to be honest here. The, the, God has challenged me in my own personal life on the areas I have made alliances with because they're comfortable, because they're easy, because they're secure, but they're not God. God is calling the same thing from us. Where is our trust? Where is our security? Where are the things that God has called us to drive out? You see, friends, if our past experience is bigger than our experience of, of, of God, we're in danger. And I'm warning us, as God is warning us by the Spirit, let's look. Let's look through our lives. Holy Spirit, come, show me. Show me the areas I have said yes to, I've come into covenant with that you've called me to drive out. Because as we begin to do that, something changes. I'm going to introduce you to the story of Israelites versus the Philistines. It's one of those historical stories that profoundly talks into this very thing. This is not new, by the way. Covenanting and, and becoming allies with the enemy is not new. It's happened all throughout history of, the, of man. Because we, we like to do the comfortable thing. We like to do the thing that's easy. And so here we see the story in 1 chapter 13. It starts with Saul being called the king. Now, I'm not going into the history of that But the Israelites called for a king because they didn't want the king, Jesus, to rule over them. God the Father to rule over them. So they called for a king. God says, I don't like this, but there we go. Here it is. Now deal with the consequence. And from that moment, we see how Saul's reign began to take place across the the Israelite nation. And the first year that he reigned, we can read it all together. It says, he reigned for one year. When he had reigned two more years... Over Israel, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in this mishmash place in the mountains of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan, his son, in in that place. The rest of the people he sent away, every man to his tents. And Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. Then Saul blew a trumpet throughout the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. Now all Israel heard it said that Saul had attacked the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel had also had become an abomination to the, to the Philistines, and the people were called together at Gilgal. And what happened at Gilgal? The Philistines came with 30,000 people of chariots and horses and armies and all sorts of military procession. And it says here, verse, verse 5, it says, the people were as numerous as the sand on the seashore in multitude. And so when the men of Israel saw this, that they were in danger, they were distressed, they hid themselves in caves and thickets and ropes and in, in, in holes and pits, And some of the Hebrews even crossed over the Jordan back to the land that they came from. They went backwards. Now I want to just share a few points around this, but I'm going to carry on next week with the major part of what I want to say. You see, in this space, the Israelites had become chummy-chummy with the Philistines. They were meant to be evil. The Philistines were meant to be the enemies. They were meant to be the people that, uh, that were opposed to the Israelites. And we see all the way through Scripture how the Philistines had no city that they occupied. They just prowled around and looked for fights. Does that not sound like someone that we know? Be on your guard. Be sober. Be vigilant. The enemy prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's looking. He's on the lookout for a loophole. And so here we see the Philistines acted like that back in the biblical times. They were the nation that had no fixed dwelling. In fact, the, 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 the research says there were five troops that would walk around in different places and they would try and ambush the people of God the whole time. Friends, that's the enemy. He knows he's defeated and disarmed. So he's prowling around looking to take away your authority and try and convince you that you're powerless. Try and convince you that you need to run away and hide. Trying to convince you that nothing's going to happen when you show up. That's what he does. He's the master of trickery and deceits. The wicked wiles of the enemy, that's what the Bible calls them. He comes in to try and tempt us to give away our authority and the knowledge of God and reason and argue against it. But God says, take every thought captive and make it beat into Christ. You're in Christ. Stop thinking like the devil. Think like Christ. And so in that space, the Philistines had become friends with the Israelites. How do I know that? Because a few verses later, it says this, and they had a master plan involved here. I think it's happening all around us as we speak. The enemy, the darkness, the Philistines, they had worked their way into this relationship with the Israelites where the Israelites were dependent on them for their blacksmiths. 
So what happened in this time is because in the, in the, in the Israelite camp there, was no, there were no blacksmiths, the Philistines offered to do all their, blacks, their blacksmith work for them, which means sharpen their tools, sharpen their, their equipment, which means make their spears and make their swords and do all sorts of things. And so because of that, Israel became dependent on the enemy because they needed them to supply them with blacksmiths. It goes on to say a few verses later, you can read uh, in, in, in verse 16, it says, um, further down, it says, Now there were no blacksmiths to be found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, Lest the Hebrews make swords and spears. So what is this telling us? It says they had intentionally gone after allying themselves with pe God's people so that they could have the upper hand in battle. They didn't want the Israelites to make swords and spears of their own and somehow turn around and annihilate them. They said, we'll carry that authority. We'll carry that role. And I think so much of the tactics of the enemy are to get us to ally with him to such a degree that he becomes the one who calls the shots. He becomes the one who influences instead of us being the one who influences. Just think about it. The goal of warfare is to win. If you have no swords or no weapons, or if your weapons are blunt and you need the enemy to sharpen them, what good is that in battle? Do you think that's a clever strategy? It's profoundly clever for the enemy. It's stupid for, the, for God's people. But how many of our lives have been yielded to the forces of darkness around us, to the culture of the world around us, that are there to dull and blunt our very ability to be children of God and to exercise our authority to enforce our victory and cause darkness to flee? What do I mean by that? You're talking foreign language here. You see, understand what I'm saying? How many of our lives are caught up in the worldly culture around us where, they are, where, the, where the forces of darkness are dictating the way that this is going to work? Let me give you an example. The worldly culture is built on this premise that if I'm not busy, I'm not doing something significant. If I'm not running from pillar to post thing, doing, then I'm, I'm, I, there's no value inside of me. Ever heard that culture? No, we all live in it, but we, we don't really question it, do we? What do you think the goal of that culture is? It's to blunt the weapon of rest and worship and intimacy. Why? Because I'm so tired of hearing the church say, I've got no time to worship. I've got no time to pray. I'm so busy, I'm so busy, I'm so busy. Friends, our tools are getting blunt at the hands of the enemy's culture to say, actually, these tactics are there to get you to be ineffective in your walk with God. And we are putting up with it, friends. I could go on so many. In fact, maybe let me do that. What about the tactics of offense? I don't hear people in the world getting offended, to be honest. Like, I rub shoulders with some people, and there are things are happening in their lives, and people are doing all sorts of negative things, and they're like, oh, leave it. The church... You say boo and someone gets offended. Why? It is a tactic of the enemy. Why? Because if we can get caught up in seeing each other as the enemy, guess what happens? Our weapon of unity becomes blunt. Our weapon of together, one heart, together united, together becomes blunt. And therefore what happens is a house divided cannot stand. The enemy is very clever with twisting stuff. And here we see in this scripture how the, the Israelites had become buddy-buddy with the Philistines, and they didn't even know they were, they were making themselves ineffective. How many of us are becoming ineffective in our walk with God because we are settling for a worldly culture that is influencing every part of our lives? Technology, busyness, stress or anxiety, robbing us of the weapon of peace and rest, self-indulgence and self-preoccupies, robbing us of the privilege and the weapon of servanthood, lay our lives down for others, lay our lives down to influence people. No, 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 can't do that anymore. That day is gone. I'm hearing people say the day of serving is gone. I'm like, what Bible are you reading? Jesus did not consider equality with God something to grasp. He made himself nothing. He took on the nature of a servant. Why? To influence the world around him. And we can't even get enough people to serve in church. How are we ever going to serve the world around us? God's calling us to be aware and alert, be vigilant, be on your guard. Why? Because if we make covenants with all these things, you make a covenant with busyness, you make a covenant with offense, you make a covenant with your pain, you make a covenant with all sorts of things, guess what happens? It nullifies the effect that you could have to drive out the darkness. And God's called us to this place. It's time for the church to rise and be aware of what's happening around us. If you do not have time to spend with Jesus, you're becoming blunt 
And when God wants to yield you as a weapon to, to, to enforce victory and to destroy sickness and to drive out all those things, guess what happens? We become ineffective and then we blame God for our ineffectiveness. God's called us in this space. And I end with this. He took a Jonathan to do what? To poke the sleeping bear. Friends, we need some Jonathans around. What did Jonathan do? In the midst of all of this, he decided to attack the Philistines. You know that Bible? Not the Bible. The saying goes like this, let sleeping dogs lie. I think we've let the dogs of doom lie too much in our lives. And we're so scared of waking them up because of what they might do. Because somehow we've distorted the view of God and made the devil bigger than God. I remember the moment we went to a restaurant in the Midlands. I won't mention because I don't name and shame. We went to a restaurant and there was a dog there. And my son was young. He was probably about two, two and a half. And the dog was lying in the middle of the restaurant. And so he went to go and cuddle the dog. But the dog was sleeping. And the, you know that saying, let sleeping dogs lie? There's a reason for that. As he did that, the dog came and literally his whole jaw went over Leiden's face. So much so that when he got out, he had puncture marks just underneath his jaw here, Leiden. His, and his temple. Like it literally went right over. Because he chose to provoke. He chose to wake up. He chose to go after something. Now nothing happened. And the crux of my story is this. We need some courageous people who are willing to poke a sleeping giants called complacency and called covenanting with the wrong things. If we aren't going to be brave enough to do that, and this is, my, this, is, uh, this is the anguish of my heart, then has Jesus died for nothing? Because if he's not going to be the one that heals all sickness, then was that merciful death on the cross just not enough? If he's not going to be the one that heals our relationships, that restores us to a place of hope and life, then is this all for nothing? And friends, I don't think that's the case. I just think we have been dulled into complacency for too long. And God's saying, Jonathan's, go. Come on. Poke your finger in that space and go, let it hurt for a while. Poke your finger here and let it hurt. Self-pity. Fear. Rejection. Failure. Insignificance. Poke it. Poke it for the place of the mercy and the kindness of God. And say, Father, I'm not going to let go until I see the Philistines defeated. The end of the story is they were defeated. Of course, when Jesus is around, they always are. But somehow in the journey, we get losing, we lose sight of that. And God's saying, it's time, friends. It's time. Are you with me? I'm provoking us this morning. I hope you are questioning your life and saying, is my life seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness? 